have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 6. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 7. First Samuel chapter 7. And if you found your place and you're able to, please stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 Samuel chapter 7, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. We'll read verse 1 all together, and then we'll read verse 6 at the end all together. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, all together. And the men of Kirjath Jearim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. It came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jearim that the time was long, for it was twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. And the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth, and serve the Lord only. Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And verse 6, all together, and they gathered together to Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, Again, Lord, we thank you for bringing us all here tonight, Lord. We know that we're all sinners, Lord, but we seek after you tonight to know the truth and to know our Savior. And Father, we thank you so much you sacrificed him on that cross so that we can understand this message that we have tonight, Lord. Have us, have us all to have hearts to seek after the, well, what you have for us here tonight, Lord. And we pray, Father, please fill our pastor up with your Holy Spirit preach what it is that you've laid on our hearts, Lord, and have us all to be attentive to that. We thank you so much. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You go ahead and be seated. Uh, in Sunday school, we looked at Nehemiah, and I think he had so much fun in the Old Testament uh, that I just want to go back to it again tonight. <laughs> uh, but I like looking at Nehemiah. Uh, this is actually, this is just for my Bible reading this week, and so uh, I was kind of read through my Bible reading, and uh, the Lord kind of put this upon my heart, so uh, I thought I'd just preach this uh, today, but really, we, we just looked at verses 1 through 6, but I do want to give some context to this, because I think this will help us understand what is going on here, and will help build us up to this point, so uh, let's really go back to chapter 4, chapter 4 in 1 Samuel, and uh, you know, the, the first three chapters of 1 Samuel so, it, are so good as well. And uh, you see Hannah, um, you see, you know, crying out for a son. Then you see uh, the promise of the son there with, with Samuel, and she dedicates Samuel to the Lord and gives Samuel to the Lord. And then because she went through with her promise, uh, you see how God then blesses her with five children uh, after Samuel. And so uh, we see how God takes care of her. Uh, then chapter 3, you see the, uh, there, there's a call from the Lord there, and uh, Samuel, he's sleeping at nighttime, and uh, God calls out to Samuel three times. Each time he goes to Eli and says, yes, Eli. Uh, and Eli, Eli's like, no, I didn't call you. And then finally Eli got the hint, oh wait, that's God. And, uh, uh, and so uh, we see how Samuel, towards the end of chapter 3, kind of becomes God's prophet. Uh, and everyone in the land knew that God was using Samuel. Samuel, and God was building Samuel up and preparing Samuel uh, to be a prophet in the land. Uh, now we get to chapter 4 then, and we see the Israelites in the first three verses here, they go to war versus the Philistines. 
Uh, and it says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel ran out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. Um, now, at this time, Eli was the prophet here, and Israel is not doing at all what they are supposed to be doing. Uh, if you remember, Eli has two sons, and they are committing horrible adultery and fornication uh, in the temple. They, they are making a mockery uh, of, of, of God by doing such an act. Uh, they are uh, being, they're, they're just horrible. And uh, you see how God promises to Eli that both of his sons are going to die at the same time, in the same day. And uh, we're going to look at that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, just Israel is not doing what it should be doing. And uh, it, it's just not, it's not right. Israel is going against God right now at this time. Uh, and so you see, we see it goes to war. Uh, Israel does against the Philistines. There's a war there against the Philistines. And in, in chapter 4, uh, we see uh, in, uh, in 7 through 9, it says, And the Philistines were afraid. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, before that, in verse 3, we see the, the Israelites bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battle with them. And with the Ark of the Covenant, you have uh, uh, Eli's two sons that go with the Ark to that battle, obviously setting up for his two sons to be killed at the battle. We see how God is just working in there and following through with the promise that he, he gave to Eli. Um, and so then in verse 7, we see the Philistines, their response to the Israelites bringing the Ark of the Covenant. They say, And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath none been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? Uh, these are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men, and fight. And so uh, we see the Philistines' response there in chapter 4 to the Israelites bringing the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, God is not with the Israelites, Israelites right now with how they are acting. Right, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, just just not with them. And you know, when you are living out in the world, uh, when you're doing what the world does, acting the way the world does, uh, God is not in that. So, so if you're if you're doing that, uh, God God's not in it. He's not going to help you um, in that. <laughs> you know, he, He's not going to help you go against Him. You know. Uh, and so, so the Israelites said, uh, man, they, you know, they're, they're without God right here. Uh, and so you see the Philistines, they, they take, they, in verse 10, they capture the ark. Uh, look at verse 11, it says, And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Uh, so the Philistines take the ark, and God uses the Philistines right there to kill Eli's sons. Uh, to take care of the promise that God had promised Eli. And so uh, now in verse 12 it says, And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. So one of the men of Israel right there of the tribe of Benjamin, he is fleeing from this battle and he is going uh, to Eli. In verse 17 he hears a report. It says, And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And they and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. Verse 18, we see Eli's response to this message, and I think this is interesting. If you remember, the messenger told Eli that his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were murdered, and that the ark of the covenant was taken. But what is Eli's response? And it came to pass when he made mention of the Ark of God. It wasn't when he made mention of his two sons. If you notice in that verse 17, uh, there was a, a priority there that, that it was mentioned. 
there was Hophni, Phil, and Phineas. I, I believe when the messenger told Eli that the messenger told Eli first, Hophni and Phineas, because that's how the Bible portrays it to be. And so I believe it was in that order. And then you see him mention the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Eli did not have any reaction until it was the Ark of the Covenant that was mentioned. Uh, and so uh, verse 18, then the rest of it says, then he fell off, uh, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake. So now you have Eli, he falls back, he hears the news, uh, not necessarily when his sons die, but man, when the ark of God was taken, he hears that news, he falls back, breaks his neck, and he dies. For he was an old man, and heavy, he was a fat man, an old fat man, uh, and he had judged Israel forty years. And then verse 19 through 22, uh, Phineas' wife, uh, she's there at the same time, hears the news about her husband dying, and uh, then has uh, goes into labor right then, names the son Ichabod. Um, and then it goes into chapter 5. And chapter 5 is such an interesting chapter. It's a short one, just 12 verses. Uh, but you see how the, <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant, how it affects the Philistines. Uh, and, and I'm not going to go really go all through this, but uh, actually I'll just read 1 through 5. It says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Okay, so Dagon is a false god right here, right? A, a, a little, little G god right here for the Philistines. So they took the ark of the covenant put it by Dagon. Now verse 3, And when the day of Ashdod arose early in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they, Dagon's bowing to the ark of the covenant, right? That's what Dagon is doing. He, he's on all fours. This statue's on all fours, bowing to the ark of the covenant. Uh, uh, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. So they, so they take Dagon, put him back in, in the right place. Verse 4, And when they arose early in the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That is great. Uh, Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon, in Ashdod <laughs> to this day. Oh man, God totally ruined that place for the Philistines. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, that, that is awesome. So, uh, so Dagon in a mess. Now, now Ashdod. Now, verse six through eight, you see Ashdod is gets afflicted right here. Uh, but then it says, "But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and He destroyed them, and smote them with emrods." even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So Ashdod right here, God put, puts a, a, a curse, uh, some sort of sickness, some sort of, uh, we don't know necessarily what that, I, I've heard different things, I really, I don't know uh, uh, what, it, what it is, what it could be, I've heard different things. Uh, this is interesting, uh, one thing that I did here, if you go to chapter six, verse five, on what these emeralds could be, uh, look at chapter 6, verse 5. Um, the Philistines, they're wanting to return the ark, and they're, they're wanting uh, uh, kind of to, to show forgiveness for taking the ark because everywhere this ark goes in the land of the Philistines, people are just getting these emeralds. And so then they go to their priests and ask, what can we do for forgiveness? So this is what one of the priests say. Wherefore, in chapter 6, verse 5, wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds. Isn't that interesting? Images of your emeralds. Okay. Uh, and then it says, and images of your mice that mar the land. So whatever these emeralds are, it attracted mice. Um, and and I, I think that's interesting because uh, it seems like from right there, uh, mice is part of the affliction too because of the emerald, uh, which they didn't necessarily have that before, an infestation of mice. And so one thing I one thing I saw about this, and I don't know, I don't know how accurate this is. Someone may have heard something better than this. If you have, let me know afterwards, and I, I want to know because I'm, I'm interested. Uh, but uh, one 
thing I had seen about this was that this could have been some form of like a bubonic plague. Um, and which would be interesting because at the end of the bubonic plague, you had mites just ever and the, the, the sickness just wasn't good. And it, obviously, this is something that was great. There was a sickness and it was, I don't know, I even heard tumors. I have no idea what it could be. Have you heard that before about like tumors? Yeah, tumors. You've heard tumors? That, so I, I don't know what it necessarily could be, but I think it's interesting. Obviously, God, you know, there's affliction right there. And, uh, this is no bueno for the Philistines right here. Uh, and then it goes to chapter 6. The Philistines, they return the ark. Uh, verse 19, you see, uh, it says, And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. You see a mistreatment of the ark right here. And uh, God, man, he, he told them how to handle the ark of the covenant. Uh, he, he told them uh, what to do with it, not to mishandle it, not to mistreat it. Um, and so, but you see a mistreatment right here, uh, and it says, uh, they had looked into the ark of the Lord, and even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men, and the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with the great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before this holy Lord God, and to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerem, saying, the Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord, come ye down and fetch it. Up to you. So now we get to this chapter seven, and really we're going to look at this whole chapter seven right here. And uh, I, I think this is a good lesson to us tonight. Um, it, it, it's it's very simple, but the the title is how to return to the Lord. How to return to the Lord, and that's the title of it. Also, you could call it a fresh start. <laughs> how to have a fresh start. You know, us as Christians, we're saved, right? We, we, we believe eternal security. Uh, and if you're here at church tonight, you don't believe in eternal security, we will urge you and beckon you to believe in eternal security, and, and there's Bible verses about it. But, but we believe that. We, we believe you can't lose your salvation. We believe that because that's what the Bible says. And everlasting life, the Bible says. And, uh, and, and so uh, we, we believe it. So, now, I'm not saying tonight that you can lose your salvation, but you know, sometimes as Christians, throughout the week, we can have a rough time throughout the week. Amen. Um, sometimes throughout the week, we need to hit a reset button. Sometimes throughout the week, we need a fresh start. Maybe we had a good Sunday, but then it's Monday morning, and uh, man, the temptation is hitting hard, and you, you might cave in, and then you need a fresh start. Um, and so tonight, that, that's what we're going to be looking at, uh, how to have a fresh start, how to return to the Lord. Maybe you've had a good couple of weeks, and then, man, trouble hits, trouble in the mind, right? Well, how are we going to return to the Lord? How are we going to have that fresh start? And so let's look at verse 1. It says in chapter 7, And the men of Kirjath Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord, and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill, and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So the ark, it goes to the house of Abinadab. Um, and then uh, verse 2, it says, And it came to pass, while the ark abode in kirjath Jerem, that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So uh, Israel, it's crying after the Lord. There is sorrow from Israel right now. The ark, it stays in Kirjath Jerem here uh, 20 years, the Bible says. So the Israelites, they, they've mourned the Philistine capture of the ark. Uh, they've mourned those, the, the death of the Israelite people for mistreating uh, the ark of the covenant. Uh, and now they're mourning because the ark is here in Abinadab's house in Kirjath Jerem. For 20 years. You know, the Israelites, they had sinned greatly in handling lightly the things of God. Man. You know, they they uh, handled lightly the Ark of the Covenant. And that's why the Ark of the Covenant was taken from them. They handled lightly the Ark of the Covenant by looking inside. They, they were scared, and so they just kept it there at the house of Abinadab. They were mistreating it. We should never mistreat 
mishandle or think light or take lightly the things of God. Amen. Church, we should never mistreat it or, or take it lightly at all. Uh, Christ died for the church. It is very important. It is not something to just shut off or, or to, to keep in the back of our minds. It is something of utmost importance to Christ. Therefore, we should think of it as something that is the utmost important to us. Amen. And that is how we should treat it. Uh, I, I really do think it's very sad, and I, you know, really almost every sermon I could preach about how other churches are taken lightly, church. Um, you know, I said at Sunday school, the fog machines, right, and the, 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 the strobe lights, and, you know, the, the, all the blinking, flashing lights. No, no one, you know, I, I think all those Assembly of God, they're not having some Holy Spirit thing come upon them which they're flipping on. It's probably just seizures from all the lights. <laughs> you know, that's probably what it, that's probably what it is. Uh, but, but all the stuff going on in the church, churches today, they're taking lightly the things of God. And that, that is a big deal to God. And we see that because of, because of how God uh, went back towards the Israelites by, by taking the Ark of the Covenant out, by killing the people who mistreated the Ark of the Covenant. We, we, you know, we shouldn't take light the Lord's Supper. We're going to have the Lord's Supper coming up in September. And uh, we, we shouldn't take light something like the Lord's Supper. Amen. That is a very important thing. Uh, and Jesus Christ told the church to do it. And, and it's one of the two ordinances of the church, Lord's Supper and Baptism. There's a proper way that we should come to Lord's Supper. We shouldn't, we shouldn't take light of it. Baptism. Baptism is, is another ordinance of the church, and it's something we shouldn't take light of. There's a proper way to do it, right? Amen. You don't just sprinkle upon the head. You don't just pour some water. Have you ever seen the, the videos of like those Catholic priests take a baby and just boom, boom, you know? Uh, you don't take light of it. There's a proper way to do it, and that is very serious to God. Pastoring. We shouldn't take light of pastoring. I really, I guess I'm saying that to myself. It's a very serious thing. Very much so. And as, as a pastor, you know, and as the church, you should hold me to the qualifications of a pastor. Amen. If I don't meet those qualifications, I should not be a pastor. If you're ever at a church one day where a pastor does not meet those qualifications, he should not be a pastor. Right? And that, that should be understood. And we should know God's word so that we can know what a pastor is supposed to be and what he's not supposed to be. Uh, preaching, the preaching of God's word, we should not take it lightly whatsoever. It is a very important thing. It should not be something that should just be uh, done half-hearted. It is not something that we should come to to hear where we just listen to it half-hearted. It is a very serious thing. It is the preaching of the gospel for which people will hear and can be saved. Amen. It's very important. Now this, though, wasn't their only sin, taking lightly the, the things of God. Let's look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth. What else were they doing? Well, they were taking light in the things of God, but also they were serving other gods. They were serving strange gods, gods that were not introduced at all by, by God, <laughs> and God wouldn't do that. Uh, they, they were uh, fornicating and adultery, committing adultery with foreign people and messing themselves up and serving other gods that were strange and we see Ashtoreth here as well. We see they were worshiping these gods. Now, uh, the Israelites, where they lived, they lived in an agrarian society. Baal, one of the gods they served, uh, is a male storm deity. And then Ashtoreth was a female fertility deity. 
So what they would do, the Israelites and, and the people in this land, what they would do is they would take these two gods and put them together. And they believed when you would put them together, the storm and then the fertility god, there would be rain and that their crops would grow. So we may think, oh man, we don't serve gods like that. But really when you think about it, they were serving those gods to meet their needs, were they not? That's what they were doing, so, so the crops would grow. You know, obviously the, the, the false gods was not gonna work, right? Think about us, though. When it comes to serving other gods, what are other gods? With the financial stewardship, right? To take care of our needs, sometimes we will, you know, the love of money, right? But we'll trust in that as a god to take care of our needs. We'll, we'll maybe look at a hungry for a position in our job. We will sometimes trust in, in a retirement account. Or we'll, we'll trust in a paycheck. We'll, we'll trust in, you know, uh, tax season to take care of all of our needs. The gods we worship today, while they may not be carved images that we make and bow down to, what we do today is we, we still deify the money, we deify the, the job, we make it a, a, a deity, we, we, we use that to provide us health and to provide security. In verse 3, Samuel, he is calling Israel to come back to the Lord. Israel is lamenting. Israel has taken lightly the things of God and it has served other gods. Do you not realize that is what we do today? That is exactly, when I think of America, that is exactly what America does today. Amen. We take lightly the things of God. We, we turn it into some show, into entertainment. If the pastor isn't flying in on some sort of cord, you know, we can't have fun. We, we take lightly of it, and then also we serve other gods. Our gods being money. Uh, a, a job, a position. That is what we've done. We've turned those into a deity. So Samuel, he's calling Israel to come back to the Lord. He's calling them to a fresh start. Samuel, he is reminding them that only God provides the security and life they need and desire. So, what does he do? What, what, what does he say to Israel? How does he call them back to a fresh start? How does he call them back to the Lord? Maybe it's during the week for us. Maybe we start taking lightly the word of God. Maybe we start taking lightly how our lives should be lived. Maybe we start trusting more in our money, in our bank accounts, retirement accounts, all that stuff that we should be in God. And we're making the, 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 the filthy mammon, the filthy and righteous stuff here, our God, and turn into a deity. What do we do? Samuel, he tells us. He tells Israel what to do. In verse 3 it says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then, number one, put away. Put away. Isn't this simple? Amen. Put away. If we are going to come back to the Lord, if we're going to have a fresh start, we need to put away the stuff that took us away. We need to put it away. Or we need to start taking the things of God serious. Amen. We, we need to start taking it seriously, the reading of God's Word. We need to understand the importance of God's Word. God's Word is not just a book. Amen. No, not at all. It should be our everything. I was uh, looking today at, uh, I, I, I love Bibles and I, I love co collecting Bibles. It's, it's a habit, uh, it, it, it's, it's a thing I like to do. I like to look at different Bibles. So uh, I, I'm a part of like this thing of face, 
book Bible people. <laughs> and uh, so one guy said, uh, you know, what is the best type of Bible for when the end times? And I was like, okay, kind of a dumb question. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I was looking at that and thinking about that. And, uh, you know, how have they done it throughout history? When you, when you think about the past, you know, uh, you know, Christians have been martyred for, for, for centuries, right? How, how did they do it? Thy, thy word have I hid in my heart, right? You realize what they would do is memorize? What they do is they, they would, man, they, they would love God's word. So if they were able to just have a page of God's word, they, they would hold on to it and keep it and treasure it. They would treasure it in their heart, treasure it in their mind. Do we understand the importance of God's word? Do we treasure it like that? Do we, do we try to treasure in our heart? Do we, do we uh, try to keep it? Do we try to memorize? Do we meditate on it? Let's not take lightly God's word. Amen. Hey, if there's something that's taken us away from God's word, get rid of it. Maybe we're spending time doing something else other than spending time with God. Hey, put that away. We need to put it away. We need to come back to God. We, maybe we need that fresh start throughout the week, and we understand it. We're, we're not focusing on God's word the way we should. Hey, put it away whatever's taking you away from it. Just put it away. And that's what Samuel's getting right here. Put it away. We, we need to put that job in its proper place. Amen. You know, a, a good thing to do is, and... My, my parents, they've always been working in ministry, and you know, my, my dad was a pastor, my dad's a pastor now. Um, you know, Faith's dad, though, he wasn't a pastor. Uh, he was a, a faithful layman in a church. He, he taught Sunday school, uh, Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock, or uh, Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock in the morning, he would go out to a place called the Hope Center. And it was a halfway house for people who were trying to get uh, you know, unaddicted from drugs, or trying to get get over that type of life. He would go and he would he would go soul winning there on Saturday mornings, and then on Sunday mornings he would go at nine o'clock and he would go and preach to them. He'd have about 20, 25 guys come out. He'd always bring them clothes. He'd bring them food, uh, and then he would go to church. He'd bring about five or six guys to church. Uh, then after that, after church, he would teach a Sunday school class. And he, you know, he was a, a very busy guy. And he loved doing the things of the Lord. But one of the things he would do, he would never pick where to live by his job. He would pick where to live on if there was a good church there. Amen. Good. And then what he would do was, he would try to find a job. Mm -hmm. It actually took him... When my, when my wife and her family moved from West Virginia to Kentucky, it took them about a year and a half to find a job. It took them a while. And then he found a job, and he was having to drive about an hour away to Loserville, Louisville, Kentucky, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Loserville Cardinals, that's what I call them. But, uh, and, and it was at a job where he just, he did not like it at all. He's like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> and then he was able to finally find a job, but it was about two hours away. But he wanted to make sure his family was in a good church, that his wife was in a good church, that, that faith was in a good church. And uh, man, he took serious church. It was important to him. He didn't decide on where to live by a job. He did it by, is this where God wants me to be? And that's how he did it. He made sure that uh, even his job was in the right place. You know. I'm going to say something. This is, this is kind of rare to preach this today. You, you won't find this much. But if it's a job that's going to keep you away from church, it's not a good job. Amen. Mm -hmm. That is not a good job at all. And that is prioritizing money over God. Yes, it is. It's not good. We, we should get out of it and look for another job. I promise you, your life will be much better if you do it that way. Amen. That, that, that is something that is, is rarely preached today. You know, even 
even in Baptist churches, which I grew up on, many people will say, well, I understand why you're not able to come to church because of work. No, I don't understand it. It, it, it really, it's wrong. There's so many jobs out there that you can find where you don't have to work on a Sunday. Amen. You know, as as our, our country moves away from from God, and it's been it used to be to where you know Chick Fil A is a rarity today, but it used to not really be that way. Yeah. You know, you'd go into gas stations or you know Kroger, and their alcohol sections would be shut off. You couldn't buy alcohol on a Sunday. And in, in some parts of the country, if, if you go to some small towns, it's still like that. Not much of what I think is blue law, I think you should call it. But, um, but, but it, as our country goes a mess, hey, don't go with it. Amen. Don't, don't, don't just go with it. Don't just accept it. Make sure we put God first. Just put that stuff away. You know, yeah, it's going to be a sacrifice, but it's worth it. Amen. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be good for you. It's going to be good for your family. Number two, what does, what does Samuel say here? says, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and then prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Number two, prepare your hearts. We, if we want that fresh start throughout the week, we need to prepare our hearts. What's the definition of preparation? We're, we probably, we're thinking, Pastor, why do you need to tell, tell us the, preparation, the, the definition of prepare? Yeah, maybe it'll help us. It says, the action or process of making ready or being made ready for use or consideration. Why should we prepare our hearts? So God can use us. We, we say we want God to use us, but we, we don't take time to prepare our hearts. Amen. We need to prepare our hearts for God to use us. Now, this is going to be by taking time with God. We need to make sure we mend our relationships. If there is a, a sin that has come in between uh, God and ourselves, we need to make sure that we fix on mending that relationship. If there is an argument that happens between my wife and I, I need to make sure that I go to my wife, and no matter if I'm right or wrong, I need to ask forgiveness. <laughs> Even if I'm right. <laughs> no, we, but we need to make sure our relationship is right. We need to make sure our relationship with God is right. That's going to take time with God, though. And we need to make sure that we do that. We prepare our hearts so God can use us. We need to make sure our heart is right, our relationship is right. We need to get a lot of Bible reading in, a lot, a lot of prayer time. And then number three, what does, what does Samuel say next? So put away, prepare your hearts, and then the third point right here, and serve him only. Then we need to serve him. What does serving mean? You know, there's a difference between serving and volunteering. Did you know that? You know, when I volunteer for things at work, which I rarely ever do, <laughs> but when, when I, I, I say that in a way, <laughs> not, not volunteer to do extra work, which would be rare because, you know, I'm not necessarily focused on that. I'm focused on the church, to be honest, but, uh, but volunteering to go do commander stuff or whatever, it's kind of pointless. But, um, but uh, when they at, when, when you volunteer for things like like I may in the future or may not do, uh, but when you volunteer, you choose what you volunteer to do. Yes. Right. You say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I'll do that. But when you serve, you have a mindset to do anything. Right. For for God to use you in any way. We need to make sure that when we prepare our hearts, we're preparing our hearts in such a way that we're ready to do whatever God wants us to do. Amen. That is servitude. That is a servant. That is serving. Anywhere. Lord, I'll go anywhere for you. Lord, if this is where you want my family to be, if this is where you want me to work, whatever it is, I will do it for you, Lord. That is a servant's heart. That's a, you know, sometimes people will think, uh, you know, I'm going to volunteer for Jesus or I'm volunteer for God. No, 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 no. Be a servant for God. Paul goes so far as to say, I'm a slave for God. Hey, it's better to be a slave to God than a slave to the world. Amen. Right? And let's, let, let's be a servant for God. Let's, let's serve him in, in everything and serve him only. So, we prepare our hearts so we can serve him. We spend time with him. Our 
relationship is now right. We, we've had that fresh start. Now we go and do. We go and do. Now, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Now, verse 4 through 6, we see the Israelites, they obey. They listen to Samuel, and they go and do it. Now, in verse 7, though, the Philistines, they hear what's happening. They, the Philistines hear that the Israelites are obeying and listening. They, they're preparing their hearts. They're putting away. And now they're serving God only. They hear that, okay? So now, but now what do the Philistines do? It says, And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. Oh no, oh no. All right, the Israelites, they're, they're right with God now. They're, they're serving God only. Their, their hearts are prepared. They put away. Oh no. Here it comes. Here, here's a testing, right? Here, here's a trying, the trying of their faith. How is this going to go? How is it going to go? All right, so in the, in the middle of the week, we put away, we prepared our hearts, now we're serving God again. We, we have that fresh start. But you're not done. <laughs> right? Right. Because there's that Philistine who, who's going to pop right back up tomorrow morning. Right? He's going to pop right back up. So verse 8. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. You know what the Israelites are doing? They're telling Samuel to cease not because they're ceasing not. They, they're still serving. They're serving God only. They, they've got their relationship right with God. They got that fresh start. They returned back to the Lord. Now, they, now they, that temptation is coming again. That, that enemy, that opposition in their life is coming again. And they go back to Samuel and they tell him to cease not. So, verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. Then verse 12, And Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines, they're defeated. You know, just because you get that fresh start throughout the week, just because you return to the Lord throughout the week, maybe you had a hard time at the beginning of the week, you got a fresh start with God, the rest of the week you still have to go. There's still work that needs to be done. Don't quit. Whatever you did to get right back with the Lord, continue doing that. Continue putting away. Continue preparing your heart. Continue serving God only. And then when that testing comes, when that opposition comes, you're going to be ready. You're, you're, you're going to be ready to face that opposition. We see here a deliverance. We see in that verse 3, it says, And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. You know, when you do that, when, when you put away, when you prepare your heart, when, uh, when, when you serve him only, it is not you delivering you, that is God delivering you. Right. When, when you. When that temptation comes, when that trial comes, when that testing comes, continue praying, Lord, help me. And he will deliver you. I, I, I truly believe that. I, re I really do. You know, the big thing today is having deli deliverance services where some pastor is going to come and, you know, spirit of thievery deliver you out of or something like that. No, true delivery is, is when you put away the things that are taken away from God, when, when you prepare your heart, and when you serve him only, and then deliverance will come, but that's from God. Amen. That's when that that's deliverance. God is going to help you. There is a blessing from that 
And there is, and we see uh, in verse 14, it says, And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored. And there's going to be a restoration. There's going to be a restoration time throughout the week. So, Monday, we go back to work. It's annoying. Frustrating. <laughs> i got to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. I have a DB run tomorrow. It's supposed to go all the way to 8 o'clock tomorrow night. You know what I did? I was like, I don't want to work 13 hours for my boss. Can we split this up into two shifts? And so the boss, he, and the Lord is on my side, so the, so the Lord worked upon his heart, stirred his heart, worked in my favor. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so now, now I'm just uh, splitting up with another guy. But, man, I know in that DV run I'm having to do, those things are so frustrating. Just driving these guys around and just hearing what they talk about is buffoonery. But uh, that can be frustrating sometimes. Sometimes I'll have an hour and a half, two hour wait. I did a DV run this past week and it was supposed to be an hour long and it turned into a five hour thing. I was out there till like six o'clock and I'm like, babe, I'm still out here. I can't believe I'm still out here. This is supposed to just take an hour. <laughs> that can be annoying. That, that can really hurt my spirit, right? Next thing you know, I'm worshiping myself and how I feel. Well, man, I, I need to go to God. Amen. I need to put away myself. I need to prepare my heart and serve him. Because you know what? Those guys are lost people. And when they see my Bible right there, they're going to know well, that guy might be a Christian. You know? I want to make sure that with my bad attitude, I'm not making a mockery of Jesus Christ or turning other people away from him. I need to make sure my, my heart is prepared. I'm putting away and I'm serving God only. Amen. Let's not take like the things of God. Let's not do that at all. Church is important. You know, talking about church, and I guess it's a little, little bunny hole, rabbit hole, whatever you call it, but there, there's a thing today called the church attendance crisis. Have you ever heard of that? Be, because of COVID in the past couple of years, the church membership for, for everyone has just gone down. Majorly, it's gone down. It's because the importance of church is taken so lightly from people. They don't think much of it. Man, you know, hey, amen, that's not going on here, though. You know, our church was started like two weeks after COVID. <laughs> or a couple weeks after. It's not, it's not going on here. Actually, I thought during COVID was a great time to start a church. It was a great time to start a church. Let's do it. Why not? As churches are shutting down... We can start up, right? <laughs> Amen. Maybe we can find some buildings from some churches that have shut down. We can own a place or rent a place, and here you go. <laughs> and so we see how God uses that. But church, man, let's make it important. Let's not take it lightly whatsoever. Let's not serve ourselves. Let's not serve our emotions. Don't be emotionally led. Don't, don't be that type of person. You know, uh, don't, don't be that person all where your emotions lead you, because it will. You need to understand that if you're, if you're a type of person that's more an emotional type person, understand that. Understand that you are. And make sure you don't let that lead you. Don't let it lead you. Go, go to God and let God lead you. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. It's a good truth. That's a lot. We just looked at like four chapters right there. Busy, busy Sunday, long day. Uh, tomorrow, though, put away, prepare our hearts, and serve God only. We'll have a fresh start every day, every day. I'm going to pray, and then uh, and I want to encourage you to pray as well. And uh, let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us, Lord. And uh, thank you for, uh, Lord, thank you for your word. And we see in the Old Testament some good examples of what to do in certain situations, Lord. And Lord, help us as we go out this week, Lord. Lord, there's, there's uh, problems that arise, Lord. And there's those sins that so easily beset us, Lord. But Lord, help us to put away. Lord, help us to prepare our hearts. And help us to serve you only. Lord, we'll have a fresh start. Lord, we love you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Just take a, a, a little bit of time and, and, and pray and uh, uh, amen.
tell someone about Jesus Christ? If you're having a bad day, tell someone about Jesus Christ. It'll, it'll really set you, it'll get your spirits high. It'll, it'll lift up your spirits. Page 396, I Must Tell Jesus. Let's sing just one song of this. Uh, I Must Tell Jesus, page 396. Again, we thank you, Lord, for this message for the week ahead, Lord. And I just pray that everybody in here would have a great day tomorrow to start off. Uh, you said the evening and the morning were the first day. The, the evening now is a good start to the week. We just pray, Lord, that uh, continue it forward. I pray in the morning when we all wake up, we'd be mindful of what we heard the day before. And that it would carry forward and bless our hearts as we serve you. And we'll thank you for it all at the end of it all. And meet together again on Thursday. We thank you so much, Father. We pray it all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.